it if your God reveal your Godhead. No, 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 no. Um, a miracle. Show us a miracle. Here's a miracle. Where? This hand. Now, I don't mean that sort of miracle. I mean a proper miracle, like the loaves and the fishes. Yes, they were proper miracles. Ask answers in Genesis to name their top miracles, and this is what they give you. The parting of the Red Sea, Jesus coming back to life, and Jesus walking on water. Their conclusion? Natural explanations, in other words science, can't account for any of these miracles. But science also can't explain how Athena sprang fully armoured from the head of Zeus. It can't explain how looking at Medusa's face turned people into stone. Maybe the problem isn't science. Maybe it's the veracity of these ancient stories. So if these were proper miracles, how can we never see any of them today? like the loaves and the fishes, or the miracle of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, who were thrown into a fiery furnace and yet walked around inside the flames unharmed. Instead of raising Lazarus, I'll raise you a table. What? That table? Ten feet. Rise up. Slowly. Slowly. Rise up. One foot, two, three, four. Slowly, slowly, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There, the table floats ten feet in space. I see it. It's a bloody miracle. I once asked a Christian to give me an example of a modern-day miracle, and he said, a sunset. Look, it's beautiful, a miracle of God's creation. But miracles are supposed to defy natural explanation. A sunset is a gaseous body of hydrogen fusing into helium under gravitational pressure, emitting white light which gets scattered in the atmosphere as the Earth rotates so that we predominantly see the longer wavelength bands of the electromagnetic spectrum. Then we have the miracle of people surviving plane crashes and avalanches, and again, these have perfectly natural explanations. It would be a strange world indeed if people never survived air crashes and avalanches. And word to Pat Robertson, just calling fish oil a miracle doesn't make it any less of a TV commercial. The miracle of fish oil, man, we appreciate this. This book is available now, The Omega Zone, A Miracle of the uh, Rx, of high dose fish oil. It's a bloody miracle! Uh, you, you have what, 14 patents on stuff? Is it 14? Yes. 14. Hmm. Never heard of anyone taking out patents on a miracle. So I spent a bit of time looking for a real miracle, like three men walking inside a fiery furnace. Then I found it. I asked a Catholic on my channel forum to give me the very best example of a miracle, and he said, That's easy. The Rosary Miracle of Hiroshima. The what now? Surely I'd heard of the Rosary Miracle of Hiroshima, eight Jesuits who survived the atomic bombing in 1945. Apparently it's famous in Catholic circles as one of the best examples of a modern-day miracle. Here's how it goes. The blast wave was felt as far away as 37 miles. Two-thirds of the city's buildings were destroyed. Although no official figure exists, it is estimated that between 80,000 to 140,000 people were killed instantly in the blast. The hundreds of fires, ignited by the thermal pulse, combined to produce a firestorm that had incinerated everything within 4.4 miles of ground zero. Yet incredibly, less than a half mile away from ground zero, eight German Jesuit priests staggered out of their home, one of the few buildings still standing in that area, with only relatively minor injuries. Later, all eight of these men would be examined by US Army medical experts, along with the other survivors of the blast. According to these medical reports, the Jesuit priests suffered no signs of elevated radiation or indeed any of the other ill effects experienced by the other survivors. 
Speaking on behalf of all eight men, 30-year-old Father Hubert Schiffer had only one explanation. We believe that we survived because we were living the message of Fatima. Wow, take that, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. You only survived a fiery furnace. These eight priests stood in front of an exploding nuclear frigging bomb and weren't even hurt. After it was over, Father Hubert Schiffer relayed the story to another priest who reported the only physical harm to himself was that he could feel a few pieces of glass in the back of his neck. As far as he could tell, there was nothing else physically wrong with himself. All eight priests went on to live out their days in full health with no cancer or side effects from radiation. And of course, priests don't lie. Their residence should have been utterly destroyed. Severe lung and heart damage, heads blown off, skulls crushed, cotton clothes catching fire. There are no physical laws to explain why the Jesuits were untouched in the Hiroshima air blast. They received enough radiation to be dead within at most a matter of minutes. What happened to those Jesuits at Hiroshima still defies all human logic. The story's not only in blogs, it's been written up in the Catholic News Agency and in the Catholic Herald, which tells us practically everything was vaporised within a mile of the point of impact, and yet the eight priests escaped virtually unscathed. And yes, they say this is just like the three biblical figures thrown into the fiery furnace. The miracle is even used to sell rosaries. Same story again. Eight priests who pray to the rosary every day, just eight blocks from the atomic explosion, minor injuries, no radiation sickness. So buy a rosary and you too can survive a nuclear bomb. Well, I'm convinced. Unless, of course, miracles are just real and easily explained events that then become grossly exaggerated. As you know, the first thing to ask when you hear something extraordinary is, what's your source? The miracle account gives us the names of the eight priests, so that's a starting point. I tracked down the source to an original report of the incident, and the one that seems to have publicised it the most at the time. This New Yorker magazine article, dated August 1946, a year after the Hiroshima bombing, quickly sold out of newsstands and was made into a book. The author, John Hersey, interviewed six survivors of the bombing, who recounted what happened to them and the people around them. Only one was a Catholic priest, Father Kleinsorger, and although surviving an atomic bomb explosion is a remarkable story, his experience was no more remarkable than any of the other five survivors interviewed by Hersey, all of whom were Japanese and only one a Christian. Hersey never singled out Kleinsorger's story as exceptional, and there was no mention of a miracle. But perhaps because Kleinsorger was Caucasian, the story of the priest grabbed people's attention. Another of them, Father John Sims, gave an interview detailing his own story of survival. But as I investigated some of the details, a few things didn't add up. Let's start with the primary source, the New Yorker story. Father Kleinsorger told the New Yorker that he and his fellow priests were staying at a downtown mission house in Naboricho, about 1,400 yards from the centre of the explosion. That's about 0.8 miles. Here's Naboricho, and the first thing you notice is that it's nearer to the edge than the centre of that one-mile destruction zone. But OK, still a dangerous place to be. Then it turns out that although houses all around them were flattened in the blast, the mission house had been double-braced to withstand powerful earthquakes. And far from being vaporised, there were lots of survivors in the blast zone. But unlike the mission house, their homes weren't reinforced. So many were trapped under collapsed houses. They didn't die because of the blast. They died later when fires spread. Others who survived in the streets tried to put out the fires or ran towards the river. So clearly the priests weren't the only survivors walking around. The New Yorker doesn't give figures for survival rates, so I checked a 1956 study titled Medical Effects of the Atomic Bomb in Japan. In the zone that priests were in, the survival rate was 48.4%. In other words, half the people there survived. But even in a reinforced house that can withstand the blast... Still a miracle that all eight survived completely unscathed, right? But again, the priests told the New Yorker a different story. According to Kleinsorger's account, at least two priests were seriously injured, 
Blood was spurting from a wound in Father Schiffer's head. Lying on the ground, he whispered, It's as if I were already dead. Father Superior LaSalle was covered in blood. Only Father Kleinzorger and Father Cieslik escaped with minor injuries, according to the New Yorker account. In Father Cieslik's case, not because he prayed on his rosary and hoped for a miracle, but because he had the foresight to take refuge under a doorway, one of the strongest parts of the house. And the New Yorker account is corroborated by the priests themselves. According to a written account by Father John Sims, Father Schiffer is on the ground pale as a ghost. He has a deep incised wound behind the ear and has lost so much blood that we're concerned about his chances for survival. The Father Superior has suffered a deep wound of the lower leg. Father Cieslik and Father Kleinzorger have minor injuries but are completely exhausted. So that accounts for four of the priests, but what about the other four? Well, the reason they weren't part of the New Yorker story is because they were in a separate building. We'll let the U.S. Army film about Father Seams tell that part of the story. Between Zero Point and the main building of the novitiate of Jesuits four miles away... Hang on, four miles away? ...was a hill which served to lessen the intensity of the blast. Now there's a hill between the main building and the blast site four miles away? Yes, it turns out the other four priests weren't even in Hiroshima at the time the bomb was dropped. In his written account, Father Seems said the building was in Nagatsuke, up a valley going into the mountains about two kilometres from the edge of the city. But there's one hope left for this increasingly shaky miracle. What about the fact that the four priests escaped any kind of radiation sickness? The religious sources say they were examined by doctors hundreds of times. Problem is, none of the religious sources cites a single medical report to substantiate this and the only medical examination I could find was of two of the priests, as reported by Father Seams. He tells a different story. Father Kleinzorger and Father Cieslik, who were near the centre of the explosion, but who did not suffer burns, became quite weak some 14 days after the explosion. The attending physician diagnosed it as leukopenia. Leukopenia is a decrease in the number of white blood cells, a classic symptom of radiation sickness. A retrospective by the New York Times reported in 1985 that Father Kleinzorger suffered from a classic case history of A-bomb sickness. The medical history of the other two priests isn't known, but Father Schiffer died at either age 63 or 67, relatively young. So after a bit of fact-checking, how's the miracle doing? Yet incredibly, less than a half mile away from ground zero... More than half a mile away from ground zero. Eight German Jesuit priests... Four German Jesuit priests... ...staggered out of their home, one of the few buildings still standing in that area... ...because it had been double-braced and reinforced... ...with only relatively minor injuries... Two of them with severe injuries. According to these medical reports, the Jesuit priests suffered no signs of elevated radiation or indeed any of the other ill effects experienced by the other survivors. At least two of the priests suffered radiation sickness, and a third died in his mid-sixties. Speaking on behalf of all eight men, 30-year-old Father Hubert Schiffer had only one explanation. We believe that we survived because we were living the message of Fatima. Or you survived because half of the people in your area also survived. In fact, two of the priests fared even worse than 2,500 Japanese residents in the same damage zone who escaped injury. For some reason, these are not called miracles. So how do atheists explain this so-called miracle? Very easily, by simply checking the records, something we can't do with alleged miracles from the Bronze Age. The more interesting question is, how was this miracle fabricated out of something that's so well documented and easily fact-checked? In 1953, Father Schiffer wrote a booklet in which he linked his survival to praying with the rosary. He named the four priests involved and mentioned only that they were wounded. Twenty-three years on, Schiffer gave an interview about the incident to Father Paul Ruger at the 1976 Eucharist Congress in Philadelphia. He attributed his survival not to the reinforcement of the house, but because we were living the message of Fatima. We lived and prayed the rosary daily in that home. And he downplayed his injuries even more. Now it was just a few pieces of glass in the back of his neck, and nothing else physically wrong. 
So the progression of this miracle is that we go from a priest who's on the ground pale as a ghost, whispering that he feels as if he's already dead, to one who's wounded, then nothing wrong except a fragment of glass, to completely unscathed. Tis but a scratch. A scratch? This is more than just debunking a silly myth. It shows how an easily explained event can be embellished, exaggerated, altered and turned into a miracle, as long as those who want to believe it don't fact-check it. If this had happened 2,000 years ago, it would have made it into the Bible instead of the Catholic Herald. And with all the documentary evidence lost, it would be cited as another miracle that science can't explain, just like the three men in the fiery furnace. The Catholic Herald is right. The story of the eight priests surviving an atomic bomb explosion unscathed is exactly like the story of three men walking around in a fiery furnace. Get it? Few modern-day miracles have drawn bigger crowds than this recurring one. It goes like this. God says, I think I'll perform a few miracles. Should I cure the kids in a cancer ward overnight? Nah. Regrow the limbs of an amputee. How about making crops miraculously grow in a drought-stricken area? Pfft. I know, I'll make a statue cry. That will be really useful. And it was so popular he did it again and again. These days it seems to be a miracle when a church doesn't produce a weeping Madonna. There's so much competition that your Madonna now has to do more than just weep. This one sheds tears of blood. The only problem is this isn't a difficult miracle to perform. Most statues are hollow, made of porous plaster and glazed on the outside. If you fill the inside with water, it seeps through the plaster, but because the glaze is waterproof, the water just stays where it is, like filling a cup. But if you scratch away the glaze where you want the water to come out, like under the eyes, presto, a weeping Madonna. This is so easy that you don't even need to struggle through the crowds to see it. You can make your own graven image at home. Invite your friends. And as congregations begin to tire of weeping Madonnas, spice things up a bit by using red dye. Or scratch glaze off the nipple area rather than the eyes, then fill the statue with milk. Amaze the faithful with your novelty suckling Madonna. It's a bloody miracle! Miracles don't just happen in Christianity, of course. Islam is full of them. But I couldn't find anything to compete with the simple magic tricks or well-documented fabrications of the Christian church. Muslims do this the way we saw at the beginning, take an ordinary, easily explained event and simply declare it to be a miracle. How can anyone prove it isn't? All these supposed miracles came from a video called Top 10 Miracles. And what was their number one? This, I know, looks very ordinary, but Allah has written his name, this name, somewhere in this picture. Can you match the name to the geographical feature? Pause the video and give yourself 30 seconds to find it. OK, time's up. According to the video, it's here. And this, remember, is the top miracle out of the top 10 miracles. My advice to Muslims is, don't try to compete with Christians when it comes to finding symbols of your religion in natural patterns. You have to find this, all they have to do is find this. And believe me, that's so easy, they see it everywhere. Laminin protein molecule. It looks just like this. They still don't give a flying f Louis. The perfect shape of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. Even I can spot a couple of very obvious crosses right here, but that's because you can find pretty much anything you want to find in this picture, including the golden arches of our Lord and Saviour, Ronald McDonald. Takasol? Believe! Did you see it, Doctor? No. Into my galvanised pressure cooker? There's no miracle. Poor God. He just can't get a break in this cynical, fact-checking scientific age. The nearest thing we have to miracles these days are magic tricks, and they're far more astonishing than weeping statues and squiggles in the sand.